Perfect. Thank you. Well, everyone, I, I think we may have some more folks joining us over the course of the morning, but I'm excited to get things started even where we are. And for anyone who's joining later after the fact, we'll be, of course, recording today's session and then posting it to the Brightspace community. This is actually our first webinar that will be kicking off our community archive series. So after this event, if you're looking to connect with the recording, we'll make sure that we're posting in our community updates discussion so you can get a notification that the uh, recording has been posted. And then this will be our first recorded series added to our 2023 community webinar. Um, so a, a great a great new addition to the, the recorded community materials. We're so excited today to have this conversation all about metacognitive teaching and learning strategies, and we couldn't be luckier to be joined by Dr. Emma O'Neill, who's an associate professor in the School of Veterinary Medicine, um, and also Dr. Carmel Hensley, who is an associate professor in the School of Biomolecular and Biomedical Science. They join us from the University of College Dublin, and they've been conducting some incredible research uh, over the last few years, actually, on uh, metacogn uh, metacognition and how we think about our thinking across multiple disciplines. Um, in addition to their research fellowship work, they've been putting that research into practice in a really tangible way, by contributing a new teaching and learning resource with the Brightspace Learning Center. It's a free course open and available to anyone who joins the Brightspace community and it invites your participation. So you actually have the opportunity to connect with researchers in metacognition to talk about how you create your own teaching plan, your own teaching design sequence, and to engage with them in the creation of one that is informed by the latest research in metacognition. So understanding more of how we can inspire learners to think about their thinking and to engage in a human growth mindset approach um, as they learn about new subjects across multiple disciplines. Um, so a wonderful opportunity and we are so excited and fortunate to learn more from our, our researcher at the University College Dublin. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone, and thanks for a great introduction, Steph. It's it's really nice to get the opportunity to be here. Um, so uh, we've been introduced. I'm, I'm Emma O'Neill. What we thought we'd do is um, Carmel's going to start by giving you a little bit of background on the project, just a little bit of a flavour, but there are videos just to explain this in more detail if people want to go off and look at that. But we thought the beauty of having you live today was just to dip into the learning resource and show you. So we're not going to do a huge amount on background or, or um, about the research, but we're going to show you where you can link out to that and do that at your own pace if you're interested. We just want to give you a taste of the, of the learning resource, but with some some knowledge of the background. So Asim, was there anything else you wanted to do before I share my screen? Because I'm feeling as always, I've jumped ahead of the game, but you, you can keep me on track. No worries, that's perfect. That's amazing introduction, Stephanie, Emma. I just wanted to quickly touch base with everyone. Uh, we had dropped in a link in the chat for the poll everywhere, and I just wanted to share the poll results. Um, it's really exciting to see a lot of us join in today. Um, early morning for a lot of the Westerners in Canada. Here I see a lot of people have joined in from there. And then we also have our lovely hosts from the um, Dublin side of places as well. Uh, I'm just going to quickly share the next question, which is what best describes your setting of education? Please feel free to up update your access and like um, respond to the poll here. We just wanted to quickly get an understanding of who's logging in and um, that can help Emma and Carmel as well direct their conversations in a more curated way for the, uh, for the participants here. Thank you, Asim. So um, I think now is, is a good time really to, to give some background. Is that okay to the, to the project? I'll start showing my screen, Carmel. So um, just to tell you a little bit about how we got to this point and having this resource in um, Brightspace and in, within the Brightspace community, um, we came together, uh, myself and Emma and two other colleagues, 
uh, back in 2019, 2020 academic year. And uh, we were brought together through a fellowship program within the university. And um, this uh, uh, fellowship program uh, brought us together uh, to design um, learning strategies and develop uh, vir virtual uh, learning um, within our new environment. At the time, the university had just uh, adopted uh, Brightspace by D2L. Um, so we were um, involved in a project uh, to get the most out of Brightspace uh, in terms of um, our uh, module development. Um, so the fellowship was to support a university-wide enhancement and four of us came together from four very dis different disciplines. And uh, this is important because uh, our goal, one of our goals was that what we developed would be applicable across disciplines and across the university uh, and would make an impact um, not just in science, which is my own uh, discipline, or in veterinary medicine for Emma, um, but could be uh, have an impact uh, broadly um, across uh, teaching in the university. Um, we have, uh, I'd just like to introduce the other fellows who were involved at the start. Um, Professor uh, Crystal Fulton from Social Sciences and Law, uh, Dr. James Matthews, a sports psychologist uh, from the, the College of Health Sciences as well. And then, as I said, myself uh, from College of Science and Emma from the uh, veterinary medicine uh, side of the house. So the overall aim of the project then was the, to use uh, develop theory driven, uh, but VLE based in our virtual learning environment. So Brightspace based uh, interventions, uh, which would uh, support um, our academic programs. And uh, this slide here is actually showing one of our first uh, very untidy uh, brainstorming uh, session uh, that we had. So we didn't know each other, the four of us. We were we had we never met uh, before the, the the project, and we all came together and we had to really kind of um, bring uh, what we felt was uh, challenging us within our teaching, and how we were going to address this in a blended learning approach. Uh, using uh, Brightspace, of course, as our virtual learning environment. And you can just see here uh, from this very first meeting, we had the various things that were coming up, uh, common ideas that were coming up. We really wanted to work on critical thinking and developing critical thinking within our students. Um, we were concerned about assessment and different assessments, formative assessment and summative assessment. Uh, feedback, a big star here on feedback and how to uh, give more feedback to our students, more regular feedback to our students. Um, and also there's a little uh, word here, peer. So peer-to-peer -peer feedback and peer-to-peer -peer learning. Uh, reflection was another area uh, we were concerned about and that students would reflect on learning outcomes. Many of these things speak to metacognition and developing metacognitive skills within our students. So that ended up being the theme um, of our project going forward. And so here is um, a nice uh, tree of um, our challenges here on the left, lack of engagement, surface learning, uh, which can be a problem when you're loading up just PowerPoints into uh, the virtual learning environment. Poor critical thinking skills, failure to see the bigger picture, lack of integration across modules. And at the other side here, we can see um, we wanted to bring interventions both in the classroom and online um, to uh, develop skills, link modules, promote active learning, and promote engagement, collaboration among students, feedback to students, um, an awareness of learning styles and to make students aware um, of, of the learning process and thinking about thinking. And, and how they develop their, their learning strategies um, as they progress through the university. So this is the, the outline then, and we then applied um, a number of um, strategies, as I said, both in the classroom and online, um, to, and we applied this then in, in test modules initially uh, across our own individual programs. And uh, we then uh, progressed uh, to ultimately, uh, and driven by Emma, I have to say, the uh, 
final resource being available with a lot of the tools that we built up over time. Uh, these are all available through um, the Brightspace community. That's great. Thanks, Carmel. So what, what I think um, I might do, but I would like to stress um, that anyone can jump in and ask us questions as we go, because Carmel and I are really keen for this to be informal. There's no point us having it real time and and um, open for people to join us if, if we're not happy to engage with discussion. But I also thought it's easier. Part of the reason we put this together, we dealt, we, we were very keen, as Carmel said, to develop um, ways of supporting metacognition. And the whole project involved use of the virtual learning environment. And we, our concept was to try and use blended learning as a way of enhancing the amount of time we had to influence students. So normally you only really influence your students when they're with you in class or maybe when they're working on assessments. But what if you had the opportunity to be kind of the voice in their ear? And Julie really liked it when I talked about it being um, Jiminy Cricket on Pinocchio's shoulder that for more of the time by just chipping away at tipping in and saying oh hello have you remembered this or how about this bit of feedback um, by having the blended learning approach now Carmel and I have presented on this quite a few times and what we found earlier on was we'd always be introducing what we'd done we tell people about our project which I'll tell you a little bit more about but when it came to the bit in bright space we waved our arms a lot and said well bright space does stuff and you couldn't really show people. So the idea of this learning resource is that we persuaded um, D2L to let us build this in the learning center, which was fantastic because it meant that now you as, as um, educators get the chance to log in and try it out and experience it firsthand to see what we mean when we're describing things. So that we, after we've shown this to you, we hope you'll take the time to dive in and, and have a look, but it's set up really, as we designed our approach to designing a module so that you can experience it firsthand. So this is the welcome page where, where you'd land in. It gives you opportunity to maybe join our research study because we want to capture people's ideas as they, as they go through this to inform further development. You can choose how you'd like to, to navigate through. Um, and these, this tells you about the different sections um, that there are in this learning resource. Now, I'm just going to go straight into the content here to give you an idea of the layout. I'm only going to talk about this for a few minutes because my hope would be that we can have a, a discussion of anything that people um, find, find interesting. So we've talked about this being part of a research project. This really gives you background um, to the project and um, where the framework came from, what, what um, research backed as taking this approach. And there are some videos, a two minute summary um, or a slightly longer summary if people want to find out about that. And what I should say is about using this resource, um, I'm just going to show this in full, full page because we've, we've had it clamped down a little bit. We're going to adjust that down. What you get chance to do with this resource is reflect on where you are now with your learning and what you're doing, and then maybe engage with trying some of these approaches and um, participating in our community of practice to get some discussion going and really have educators learn from each other. So we're hoping people will engage with that. So going further through the resource then, Really, it's designed to set the scene. It tells you a bit of background about metacognition, get, hopefully get you thinking about things like the metacognitive cycle and um, what, what we mean by metacognition, but then actually also having some video material in there. So we're, we're practicing what we preach, which will become obvious as I tell you a little bit more about our framework by giving you multiple means of engagement. You can read about things, you can watch videos. Um, so we're, we're trying to do, the, we, we're following universal de design accessibility approaches as well. So we also would like you to think about how you design for learning. So when I show you our metacognition design framework, it's really helping to enable educators as designers as a way of using um, digital technology well. But we'd like you to think about where you are now, what you do, what the advantages of these things are before you dive in by way of some background. So a little bit of thinking about active learning and what that might mean and why how you might take a community of inquiry approach to start drawing on ways of drawing your learners in, capitalizing on, on group 
uh, on multiple heads coming together to learn from each other. Um, a few different approaches that we use just to try and introduce them um, and some, exam some examples to show. So one thing that I always think is really powerful is I can tell you lots of things about how I do X and Y. And if it's a complex task, I, I guess the analogy would be when somebody I ask somebody how to navigate to a place I've never been to before. I start to zone out after they've said turn right several times and don't listen to the rest. Whereas if they could show me I might take it home a little bit more. So we've got videos like Austin's Butterfly that doesn't say to the students, oh, well, it's great if you get feedback and work on peer feedback. It actually shows peer feedback in action with junior school children and says, look, well, hey, if they can help each other draw a really complex butterfly, surely you can learn from your peers. So it's trying to show people rather than rather than telling them. And then we've got a section on reflection on learning and why that's important and just start thinking about how how students might respond to feedback and how you might use that so we've we've flipped back up to the metacognition because that links back so then then really following on with the show don't tell we've got some video exemplars of how we've tried this in our research project going forward so you can start thinking about um, using these approaches and then Steph put together a fantastic personalized learning package to show how you might how you might experience this as a student if you start putting some of the interactive um, opportunities that are available in Brightspace into play. But if if you're not using Brightspace, those sort of approaches can um, can be used in in other VLEs as well. And so, we can pause you there to make trouble. So yeah, absolutely, fire away, Steph. I think one of the coolest things that your research team has done in this particular learning opportunity is demonstrate a variety of different online learning tools that really are used to engage with the learner in a really personal way. And I think um, in particular, some of the things I really like about that kind of personalized learning journey piece, we've embedded a few intelligent agents inside of that package. And, and some of that really came from I, I think a stroke of Emma brilliance. I was wondering if you wanted to chat a little bit about your thinking there, because I thought it was um, it was a really, really insightful approach to really like walking the talk. Well, thanks, Steph. Well, it just comes back to me. Maybe it's the way way I am, but I don't really. I don't really get something until I've seen it in action. I'm I'm a very dewy person, and I I, I hate following recipes because it involves reading and loads of instructions, but not seeing it happen. So I just felt um, Carmen and I were lucky enough to attend Fusion a few years back and attending workshops and actually seeing things in action just really galvanized my brain into ways that could use it. So I've worked with lots of people and helping them use aspects of Brightspace around campus. And really people have far more confidence in doing something if they've actually seen it and they know what the result's going to be. So what we tried to do with this learning resource is if we've said, well, we'd use an intelligent agent to respond to students doing X, so they might click on, uh, fill in a task and submit their answer. If you do that in this learning resource, it responds to you as as um, as we're expecting you to put mechanisms in place for your students. So it really does give you the chance to say, well, if I select I'd like to learn this way, how does the VLE change when I've selected that? So if you log in, this this um, this learning resource is going to respond to you and give you opportunities to then uh, experience the personalized learning approach. So that's what we think is exciting. It gets you to to see um, to see in action what it what it says it does. So coming on to the the letting you learn as a learner. I'm just going to share my screen more broadly here because it's crunched things up a bit. But um, if can I ask one more question? I'm so sorry. Yeah, of course you can. Yeah. I just feel like it's such a great, great thing that you've done there. I, I sometimes worry that with that word intelligent agent, that it, it feels like something really, really complex and really difficult for uh, a new educator with bright space to use. But at the end of the day, just as you've you've explained it, it really comes down to sending a personal email that reaches each student who's engaged with that material based on 
criteria that you've outlined. So that initial kind of instinct of recognizing someone's perseverance and willingness to try just that first log in experience, that curiosity of the student to go, come into the learning material and take a look. You're able as that educator to reach out to every student, even if you have a very large class size, to send that email that says, I see that effort. And I, I think that's wonderful. Here's the next step on your learning journey. And in that one email, this is the, what the intelligent agent tool does. It really sends an email um, that you can address to the student by their first name. So you can reach every individual learner at the time that they've done a specific action by their first name. And you can recognize a specific behavior that they've done, something that is indicative of a really good learning strategy, individualized learning strategy on the part of that learner. You've come in early to the course and you've started on your way. Here's your next step. I just think that's an incredible way um, to use technology to reach a large, large audience, but make sure that the experience feels very personalized for each learner and that you're seeding their experience through an online learning experience with lots of personal touches that recognize what they have done as one individual to further their own learning experience and really um, kind of embody those, those human growth mindset traits. Well, reinforce good behavior, I think, is is the thing as well. If somebody's done something good, like engage with content or do the task that you've asked, positive reinforcement is is um, is a, is very good and and is is the way forwards. It's far easier than as a as an educator trying to chase people if things haven't arrived. If you can get in there and have personalized responses come back saying that's great, you've done this. Have you thought about adding this? That's what I mean about the Jiminy Cricket. Yeah. Got far, far further with Pinocchio by trying to reinforce quickly if he was going the wrong path than letting that go on for ages. And I think sometimes it's easy to underestimate how, how powerful that can be. Even switching to personalizing makes quite a difference because I noticed that emails or announcements that got ignored in general until crunch point had hit. If I started personalizing them, even the people that had submitted panicked and sent me a note saying, I see you wrote to me and why have you written to me? Because they presume it was targeting them more. So it does have quite an impact, even something quite minor. And that's the power of the replace string, which is another tool that I think your course demonstrates really, really well in a variety of places. You use it in intelligent agents, so that email that reaches out to users. And what I love so much is that for those listening, either here live today or watching or recording afterwards, if you're hearing that idea and thinking, I would really like to see what one of those emails looks like, all you have to do is log in to the Brightspace community, access this course, and, and start to look through the materials, you will receive one of those emails. And what I think Emma has, and, and Carmel and the research team have done so well is actually let that email know uh, so it's written right into the body of the email, which you will receive that this is an example of the intelligent agent in Brightspace, and you're receiving it because you've engaged with the course in this way. So it, it kind of reveals itself to you. But if you are an educator who's really interested in using this type of tool in the future, it's a great way that you can get a great example of it in your own hands and check it out. And it includes what Emma was just describing, a replace string that speaks to you by name. And that Brightspace tool that allows for personalization is also demonstrated in announcements and in other areas of the course, which I think is so smart because when the announcement speaks to you, when it says, well, hi, Carmel, we noticed that you're dropping in today to take a look at this material. It really does catch your attention when the class announcement is saying your own name. You you do feel that that's an announcement just for you. And it's a great way to encourage that kind of open communication and feedback. Am I running behind? Maybe I do need to check out the checklist, which is another fantastic tool that I think your resource does a great job of demonstrating as a mechanism to help learners understand how they're pacing themselves through the course. So where uh, where are there opportunities for them to demonstrate 
they're learning across the course and how are they progressing through time? Are they running a little bit behind? Are they are they keeping pace? Do they need to reach back out to um, the course facilitator to indicate an area of challenge? So some, some great resources there. Thanks, Steph. So what I might do actually is just show you, because we've talked about our research and framework, and the one thing I'd say is this is quite busy, but what I want to tell you just by way of orientating you is this if you watch one of the short videos it explains it in more detail but what we did was take a body of evidence that told you um, that showed that to support metacognitive learning you needed to use multiple strategies with students to do it well so what we did was mapped out all of those strategies and thought how we could do it best by combining um, face to face and online learning and group those into learning resources or learning support. And then they're color coded as to which of the, which of the mechanisms we're using um, with student activity very much centrally placed and thinking what learning resources and supports we could put in place to help them. So what we did was um, broke this down really into, in, into this approach that you can use yourself, but it, but it also can be summarized slightly more by the IC learning strategies in that these can be um, considered more around resources that are framed around introducing learning and introducing metacognition in a structured way, how you might signpost for students where you want to be going, because nobody understands what's expected of them if it's not made really, really explicit for them how you might enable them to do this by giving quizzes and discussion boards and all of those sort of flexible, uh, flexible scaffolding that Steph was referring to that we show in place within this as you start learning in this module and then ways of evaluating them so that they can build the metacognitive skills that involve knowing what strategies there are, what strategies they can use for their learning and learn self-regulatory sc um, um, skills like being able to self-assess, being able to understand where they are on the journey. And remember that Jiminy Cricket is then going to be delivering them little, little snippets of feedback on how they're doing, whether or not they could be doing anything else to help them. So I, it's not our plan to go into this in too much detail, but if it whets your appetite as to something that's interesting, you can, you can learn more about that. But by way of orientating you around the remainder of this learning resource, this, le this learning journey, as we've called it, with these different um, learning strategies are then broken down here in terms of tangible way for you to progress through and learn about them. And if I just choose one of these, for example, we actually then explain to you what, what we did, what we mean by the introducing um, objectives and what we're looking to do. You can join a discussion board to discuss with other people about that and learn how to develop your own framework to, to work from. But we've also got examples. So there are um, examples of what we did and links to resources we've used. So that it's very much designed around enabling you to use this approach in your own teaching, should you wish. Um, and literally plug and play, you can take some of the examples we've got, like Austin's butterflies explain to your students about feedback, or maybe you might want to use checklists in this place and you could use checklists with responses to the students if they if they respond in a way you'd like them to or prompting them if you think they could do better. So then, for example, when we look at, um, I guess the enabling one has some other examples in. All of the time we've got ideas of what we did and then links out to what, what resources you could use, examples of quizzes, examples of re reusable learning resources we used, example checklists, but set up in a way that you can actually see them in action so that you know what you're, you're going to subject your students to should you take that approach. And Steph's section that she added in was, um, and now for and now for the science bit behind, Steph has got some plug and play things in place that if you um, actually participate with this, then it downloads options for you to use in Brightspace yourself to try out. So I think that was really all I wanted to do by way of showing you around here, because I think it's far more fun to try it out than to have me explain um, but I just thought everything feels more tangible if you see it's in action for a little bit and see see what 
will happen if you log in. And, and then really we'd love you to, to ask us questions if you'd like to now. Um, I could jump in uh, for taking questions. Uh, first of all, thank you so much. Uh, this is a fantastic resource. Um, I'm definitely gonna take a look at this after. And just to be clear, Steph, is this this is available in the community. Um, I can check this out right now. Yeah, and yep, fact, absolutely. Okay. One of the things, and this was like, it's such a gift, but our researchers at the University College Dublin have provided to us. Not only can customers of Brightspace check out this resource, engage with it, engage in the discussions, reach out to researchers who are using this design sequence, this research to inform their own teaching, but anyone at all, anyone anywhere in the world who is interested, whether they're a customer, not a customer, thinking of using Brightspace, not yet using Brightspace, can connect with this resource just by creating a community account in our legacy community. That's the key to getting into accessing this resource. And soon, of course, we'll be connecting it with our brand new community site. Um, but that that resource is available and open to anyone. So a, a great resource to share if you're curious to check out Brightspace, if you know someone who's interested in, in seeing an example of a great, great course that's using, I think the latest and greatest in online teaching tools, specifically um, placed and, and set to encourage that thinking about our thinking. How are we engaging with the resort, uh, with the learning material, again, regardless of the subject matter? And I think, Joy, I'm just like, I'm very inspired by your question too, but I, I love the way that the research from the team has allowed us to consider how these techniques can apply, whether you're teaching in um, more of a, a science setting, so Carmel, more of the the biology types of settings that you're teaching within a veterinary science uh, area like Emma is, or a library sciences program or a social studies program. So how it might apply across lots of different subject matters. I, I think that's that's a wonderful thing. And another thing I might add, Steph, is that the more I've done this, the more I think that it actually helps us as educators quite a lot because Part of the thing you need to do if you're wanting to support your learners in thinking about their learning is actually step back and think, well, how do I learn and how how am I doing these tasks and, and actually really get to the nitty gritty of your own thought processes, because you need to role model this type of um, way of thinking and, and actually make yourself more self-aware of how you can explicitly explain that. And working around a module like this starts to make you self-aware and think about these things as well. So I think it, it really it, it's really quite nice how it drives that process, because we have to think about it explicitly to put these things in place for students. But all the time, it's actually re reinforcing that behavior in ourselves. And the more you interact as part of a community of learning with your students and get them reflecting and posting about reflections, the more it informs your interaction with them, it strengthens the community of learning and, and it, it really does build that community of inquiry approach. So I think it, it's it's really quite an interesting um, interesting experiment, which is why we wanted to put in the, the ethics to, to gather data from this and would really love it if people sign up to be part of that, because I think it's quite powerful um, that it's enacting, enacting what we're wanting to happen, which is that that driving group inquiry. I might also add there that um, thinking about your framework and you know your module or unit of, of learning, um, and often within modules, there are many different types of activities. Well, in the sciences, you've got laboratories, you've got lectures, maybe some projects uh, and a, a good framework and really thinking about how you sequence activities and how you link activities within a module um, you know, really enhances the, the delivery of that module and, and linking up the tasks and not just breaking it down into uh, separate activities. Um, so it brings everything together better. And then you can also make better links to other units of learning that maybe came before. 
I think that's uh, really interesting, isn't it, Carmel? Because it links back to it was really nice re rediscovering that whiteboard, although it kind of looks crazily messy. It's interesting to see just how much we had in there on day one meeting each other. Um, and one of the things that frustrated us was how, how everything was so broken up with modules and, and the students just don't join things up. Now, we did develop this for use in a module, mainly because we had to do something that was deliver deliverable over a short time period for the purposes of the research project for us study. But actually, the beauty of this is if you do get into thinking about a framework that joins, joins the dots and links things up, this is very applicable in a wider setting than just a module. But it, especially if you use this type of approach more broadly, you can link up. And I think that's very powerful. I think modularization is great on so many levels, but actually what we need to do is, is the real bigger thinking, uh, bigger picture thinking and getting students to join things up together. Um, and, and that's something that this framework helps with as well. The community team has had just the pleasure of connecting with both of you on an ongoing basis for a while now. We've um, done some little short interviews with you and just really um, have been loving the opportunities to continue to learn from you. Emma, in one of those conversations, you mentioned um, sort of a real life example from your veterinary um, practice. Um, do you remember that one? I'm just yeah, wondering no, if you, I, if you I mind sharing that, because I think it's we just, were just a really talking good. talking about the sort of learning we wanted to drive. Um, and I guess what I'd used as an analogy is that if you were taking your dog or your cat to the vet, you'd want to see a vet that actually was able to explain to you about the problem and the context of the problem that your, the, your pet had. Um, and discuss what the options were. You wouldn't want them to be just able to list all of the disjointed facts that they knew, knew about your dog or cat. So what we're trying to do with this is by increasing students having self-awareness of their learning and linking things together, you're enabling them to grow their transferable knowledge and, and be able to use it and respond to, to changing world. And you're building really powerful learning skills. So I think that's the, I think that's the example you were referring to, isn't it, Julie? Absolutely. I just, it really resonated with me because it was just such sort of an easy way to understand that, you know, it's, we're not just teaching the facts. It's no longer, is it an effective method to say, you know, memorize all of this stuff. It's just, you know, getting them to be able to apply those, be thinking about the knowledge and applying it in real life settings. So I really I think, appreciated that example. Thank you. Thanks, Julie. I think it's about future proofing um, your students' education and actually thinking what it is we offer as educators. And another of the things we talked about is um, the future of education and where we were going. But really, ownership of knowledge in terms of just facts isn't helpful anymore we can get facts everywhere but what's really important is being able to sift through and a decide are they fake facts or not now is really important but what you do with the information how you use it and really enabling your students with future-proof tools in their learning so that they can look they can carry on learning and unlearning as things actually become obsolete relearning and adapting and that's more and more important in today's world um, and and is something that I think is far more enabling for our students because they get they get awash with information it's actually quite overwhelming and if you're trying to get them to learn overwhelming quantities of information a that's not it's it's unhelpful for them because that, that that information might be obsolete very quickly. You're really enabling them if you're able to help them have skills to start sifting through what's valuable, sifting through how they address what their deficits are and how they can respond to the environment around them. That, that's priceless. That's proper. That's a proper education. And within our modules also, the students are working on, on projects and you know things like project management are really supported by uh, the various tools that we use for checklisting feedback they can work as groups they have discussion boards uh, so these are all life skills and um, employment skills and so i'm focused very much on pharmacology all the time um but the students are doing group projects individual projects and 
rather than me being there all the time and responding to lots of individual emails from students, uh, if you put the effort into setting things up uh, within your module, uh, you can do a lot of that automated um, getting the students to check where they are in the project, what needs to be done by a certain date, meeting as a group, discussing where they are, making decisions. And you can set up um, uh, text messages, et cetera, where they can just text in. They have to uh, every so often just let me know where they're at, what the problems are. Um, and that it really helps in that regard. One of the conversations that you recorded earlier as an interview with the community team that I thought was really very poignant for where we are right now was this question about what role online learning plays in this post-pandemic world. So thinking about the kinds of um, challenges, real challenges that students of all ages um, folks in, in their career settings all over the world really faced during the pandemic. So the sense of isolation and the sense of um, growing concern about men mental health in particularly in education settings, but also in, in work settings. I think part of that um, challenge that comes with working in a more remote capacity or working in a more online capacity is um, also really addressed by the resource that you've provided because you're you're doing two things. One, I think you're helping to demonstrate to other educators the types of techniques that they can use with their own students to celebrate that kind of theory of small wins that you can facilitate amongst young people their own experience of building their own resilience. So learning how to scaffold their own sense of kind of good mental health and self-care practices by recognizing where they are making it a real achievement, um, even if that's a small step. For instance, the example we spoke about earlier where the student is recognized simply for their, their earliest login, that they took the time to log into the learning environment and look at something is recognized with a personalized email that says, Emma, you've done a great job. We, we know that you've taken the time to look in on your learning materials. We're here to celebrate that. And your next step is, so keeping the student on, on a path so they understand what's next for them. Um, and so they also have a sense of how or when or where they might reach out if they're experiencing challenge. So I think it's it's exciting that you're demonstrating these techniques to other educators, but also building in these approaches to build that kind of resilience for learners, again, across multiple disciplines. It's uh, the skills that you're teaching are obviously very critical for the learning paths that the students are on, but so is this underlying underlying um, awareness of the importance of learning about how we learn as individuals and learning about how we kind of foster that inner strength to um, to be willing to learn because it's it's a very challenging thing you you become very vulnerable when you have to admit that this is something that you don't yet know and you're trying to master a new skill it's very difficult no, I think I think there's so many different aspects to to start thinking about, and that's that's hopefully what we did by just trying to sow seeds of getting you to think about different aspects as you log into this learning resource and and hopefully share those because the community of inquiry approach is exactly what um, if you if you think through um, having that that social presence that um, that learning presence it can be very very powerful. I mean, I was actually thinking there at the moment I've taken and the plunge and signed up for a charity thing where I have to run 6k every day for February but they've got a they've got a community with that that we've all logged in and we're all egging each other on but I think it isn't to be underestimated just how powerful that is that you know that if you've logged in and said oh look I got off the sofa and did that today there are lots of people going to get back in touch with you and say that's fantastic Emma it doesn't matter it took you three hours to do that at least you did it 
but that's that's actually it is really positive and and some of the reflections i've had from the students over the course of this they they reflect on their learning which is a really interesting two-way street because you get quite an insight into what they're thinking that way and how you can adjust they they've talked about mental health actually spontaneously and how it's made them feel more empowered that they're thinking about this and they've realized that actually they didn't have a growth mindset and they were feeling judged and feeling like they couldn't judge other students by giving peer feedback. But as an educator, then I know the impediment to them giving peer learning feedback now and try and tackle that ahead of the, uh, the curve. And they learn that actually, do you know what? It is better to give constructive feedback. It's not a criticism. It's actually a gift of something that can help somebody else improve. And they were far better at understanding that when they saw the little kiddies giving feedback with Austin's butterflies. So it's a, it's a really nice two way learning curve. I just can see some chat there. Asim, you've posted something actually, but I'm not very good at reading reading as I go when I'm chatting, although maybe it would stop me chatting. I always talk too much. Has anyone got any other questions? Uh, I just had a quick another quick question. Um, so it sounds like based on the conversation, you're able to use some leverage some aspects of Brightspace, like intelligent agents. Uh, I heard discussion posts, stuff like that. Uh, I was just wondering if there's any, based on like these tangible uh, metacognition strategies, um, is is there anything in Brightspace, like are there any gaps that you'd say, well, this didn't really meet this, uh, this principle, or if that's kind of too specific, maybe just in online learning in general, is there anything that doesn't really lend itself to this? That's a really challenging question, Joe, right there. I'm... I'm trying to think. I suppose I do. That's that's not necessarily the way I'd come at this. So that's why I'm thrown. That's a real curveball to me to know how to answer because I tend to work by identifying what I want to do and looking around for the best fit that I can shoehorn into that. So I haven't actually tried. I haven't actually thought about it from that perspective. I don't know. Do you have anything that springs to mind, Carmel? Because as I say, I, I tend to sift through things and think, oh, how could I shoehorn a bit of that to do what I want in this direction? So I don't have anything to answer to that. I don't think of, I can't think of anything straight off, but like you said, we kind of work with what we have and we try and fit everything in and, and extract the most out of it. Um, I'd have to, I'd have a think about, I, I could have a think about it and feedback did you have anything in mind yourself? Was that asked because there's something that you've struggled with doing that that, that sprung, question sprung from? Well, I'm an instructional designer here at D2L uh, <laughs> working on kind of improvements to the platform. So uh, I'm, interested. <laughs> I'm always interested in people, if users, uh, if there's certain things that aren't uh, meeting their needs. Or, um, and I see, I, I see you where know, you're coming like, from. As I read this uh, this course, and I'll spend some time looking at it, I'm sure that there's uh, insights I'll get to kind of apply to what I'm doing. So, Joey, one thing that I would say uh, that I think is really exciting about what uh, what the research team has done is they do have a real focus, especially um, in in some of the particular modules. I know Emma mentioned the Austin's butterfly example a few times today, but uh, there's a real focus on the need to develop. Um, that that resilience again in students and that sense of how will I use my past learning experience to inform my future learning success so that if I've struggled in the past, I can use, use the experience of where I've struggled to make myself stronger in the future. And I think a part of that effort is really um it's really well scaffolded and really well modeled where we have lots of opportunity for peer collaboration and, um, and peer feedback tools. And I think that the team does a really great job of demonstrating how that can be done with discussions. So inviting students, uh, and, and in the case of this resource, inviting educators to share some of their learning design sequences and comment on each other's and share different practices. But I know through our community, and I think this is really exciting, uh, we've actually had examples of peer feedback tools 
developed by other educators who love Brightspace and are very tech savvy, who've used some of our Brightspace APIs to develop a, a peer feedback tool that can actually be downloaded from the Brightspace community if you're curious to check it out and then used inside of your own environment. It definitely requires uh, the, the efforts of someone who has more of a development background so that you can connect those APIs. But I think it's a really good example of the ways that educators around the world are looking to use Brightspace to um, encourage exactly that kind of peer-to-peer -peer support where you can have an open conversation about what your peers in a field are noticing about your work um, and where they feel you have real strengths and where they feel you also have opportunities to continue growing uh, and continue building on your skills. So having sometimes those, uh, those tools in hand that allow peers to easily contribute feedback to one another, and then also to have some of that feed into a, a cumulative mark, even if it's or a summative mark, even if it's um, sort of filtered through another assignment type, is I think a really, I think that's a really exciting and rich area for us to continue uh, to continue down. And I know there's there is some exciting work happening in exactly that space, but thought I would throw that one out there. <laughs> I think guiding the students round the um, round bright space is one of the things. Actually, the students are not necessarily. I, I guess we. We're dealing primarily with these resources with students that are campus based a lot of the time or that's what they that's what they feel that they are. So both the educators that we're working with and the students sometimes have a little bit of a feeling, oh, well, this is only supposed to be a a repository for me to pick X and Y up from. So we have to kind of work with you think it might just be the staff that have that mentality, but actually the students do. Um, they have a really fixed idea of what to expect. So I would be quite different to quite a few people in my uh, in my school in that I do use Brightspace in an interactive way. So you have to you have to actually win the students over as well. So I think that if if they get personalised responses and if they get something that actually fizzes and pops when they press it, rather then then that draws them in slightly more. But the one thing I've had as feedback is that they find they can get lost and find navigation difficult sometimes. Now, I don't think it's particularly the way it's set up with, with the module I'm doing. I just don't think they expect to have to spend time navigating around. So that's one thing I'd give us feedback is I don't know quite how we address drawing in and keeping students navigating around exactly because they're so fixed in their mind that they don't want to have to try to look or to 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 step through so that's just something that's come back in thinking in answer to your question joey yeah, great thanks so much the other th thought i have there as um is more around not so much the individual unit which is what we've been working on our individual modules but how those tiles are grouped together or not grouped together as is the case now so we just have a list of <clears throat> long list of modules and we can just pin one or two to the top of the list, but it'd be nice to see them organized as courses. <laughs> you might not want to ask questions you don't want to know the answer to. We'll give you a big list of things to things to start adding to the list of things we like. Uh, I'm all for it. <laughs> Well, we can see that you're you're chiming in, but we just can't hear your audio just yet. If you want to, though, you're you're also very welcome to enter it into the chat. It's nice to see you. I always think it's good to interact with people when we can see you. So it's great to see you. I think it's Gore, and I hope I'm pronouncing that properly. If you type it into the chat, I can answer you.
it's always it's always much higher. Oh, that's an interesting one. I might I might not try to answer that one. I might pass that over to you, Joey. <laughs> I don't know how to answer that one either. <laughs> Actually, it might be better. The one thing I'm thinking in recordings is you don't always see what's in the chat box because I've been caught out as somebody trying to watch afterwards. So what Goran's asked us, he's laid down the gauntlet actually, but I view this as laying down the gauntlet to D2L rather than myself and Carmel, is have you thought about using Jack um, chat GPT to navigate round and and help people navigate, which I think is a, a really fascinating idea. But I'm not even going to try and comment on that one. <laughs> There's been loads of chat about chat um, chat GPT and what we do about it. Uh, the one thing I would say is I think that it's really exciting and people are saying, oh, should you let students use it or not? Well, I think if we're trying to enable them to be effective, authentic learners going forwards, then of course you have to expect them to embrace using everything as much as possible. So I don't think there's any point as blocking it out. We just have to be more inventive in what we're asking them to do and get them to use that and learn as another tool and help them create more use it to help them create self-awareness by deciding whether or what not the output it's given with them is is accurate and is going to help them and and uh, use that as another layer of the thought process but that's the only way i'm going to reply about the chat gpt goran not from a not from a use of bright space perspective i was hoping <laughs> joe was going to jump in there but um he hasn't done <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's early days and we're just kind of, we've had a few little talks about AI tools and how we can leverage those here at D2L. But um, yeah, that would be an interesting uh, experiment to see how it kind of navigates the course, for sure. Catherine, hi, Catherine. It's great to see you here as well. Oh, yeah. Hi. Um, hi. I've been lurking in the background there. So I'm sorry I only made it for the second half. Um, so I'm I work in UCD uh, with Emma, and I'm in IT services in UCD, and I'm a fan of uh, Brightspace and of the metacognition module and of the community. So um, I just came to listen to some things, and the only thing I would I would be able to add is that I think that that metacognition module or course uh, is so chock full of inspiration that um, I'm hoping we in my team. Will draw from it, um, but I don't have anything to uh, offer you today that where we did this because of that exactly yet. <laughs> but um, I, I think it's a beautiful piece of work. Thanks, Catherine. Well, we're hoping from a, the perspective of UCD to start. We've got um, several people that have joined us as metacognitive champions to try it out in different settings mm -hmm. along the same lines of, uh, of what we were saying about using the Brightspace tools. You're far more comfortable to use something if you can relate to it. And that's really comes back to what I was saying, Joey, about how I've gone about tools. I've kind of been watching something and thought oh I could use it to do that which is where I think people often come from and so what we're hoping is with metacognitive champions in different areas so we had somebody join us from maths and somebody join us from nutrition um, is that if somebody else then sees it's applied in those settings it's easier for them to think oh well actually I work in an area similar to that I could use it so we're hoping we're hoping to make an application to get some support for some funding to take this further and drive it more widely across campus um, is, is our hope and plan. But, but with this resource, we were hoping that we'd get people joining us from across the world and thinking about ways of applying it because mm -hmm. the pow power of numbers and exponential increase in ideas is where, where we've got great opportunities now. Mm -hmm. Well, I know yeah. we're coming right up to time, but there's so much more to discuss. And I love the direction of the conversation, Goran, with the focus on chat GPT. I think there's a ton more that we can discover there. Um, so I think to all those who are able to join us today and those watching the rest of their recording uh, asynchronously, 
Please don't be shy to keep that conversation going, certainly in the UCD course uh, through the Bright Space Learning Center available to you through your registration with the Legacy Bright Space community. Um, if you have any questions at all, please reach out to us on Twitter, through the community. Uh, we're, we're so happy to be in touch. You can also send us an, an email out to our inbox or watching there as well. Uh, we will be posting the recording, of course, to the Bright Space community, but we do want to hear more from you and we'd love to keep that conversation going. So a big thank you, especially to the team from UCD for spending this time with us and for the incredible gift of this resource to the Bright Space Learning Center. Uh, that course will remain up in the Learning Center for lots of folks to come and engage with. So we're, we hope to see you there. Thank you, everyone. We wish you a wonderful rest of the day. Thanks very much. Thank it's you. Great. Thank Thanks you. for hosting. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Bye.